So I'm going to get started because um, we are going to use probably all of the time that we have today. Um, and I'm really, really excited. It's uh, going to be such a fun topic, really interesting and really, really relevant to sustaining your memory lab. So I'm just going to start off with a few slides, um, but the heavy work today is going to be carried by Morgan Morell and uh, from Bay Area Video Coalition. He's the preservation manager there. And then Blake Hatton from Pueblo City County Library District in Colorado, who's the digitization coordinator there and is also part of our first cohort from the Memory Lab Network. So yeah, today we're gonna to be talking about circuit boards, your circuit board and you, an introduction to PCBs and soldering. Okay. Electricity, just a little uh, refresher that uh, you might remember, and if not, that's cool too. In order for electricity to do any work and do its job, it needs to be able to move. Electricity can only flow through materials that conduct electricity, such as copper wire, which will come in later. You've heard of electrical currents, right? So you can put things in the electrical currents path to do useful things, um, when the current flows through them, such as uh, lighting an LED light bulb up, you cannot see current flowing, only the results from that current. This flow is a circular path, which is always required to get electricity to flow and do something useful like light up the LED. This is why it's called a circuit. A circuit is a path that starts and stops at the same place. If you were to take apart any electronic device like the VCRs in our memory labs, many typically contain a circuit board or circuit boards. A circuit board is a physical piece of technology that allows for the assembly of electrical circuits on it. Typically, these circuit boards are called PCBs, printed circuit boards, the components on a PCB work together to form a complete system to power and operate our electronic devices. There are several different types of printed circuit board components, each with a different function. They give the circuit the unique qualities that make it fit for its intended purpose. Depending on the device or electronic item a PCB is designed for, different components will be needed for different circuits. So the LED I mentioned is a component and other examples are resistors, transistors, capacitors, among others that Morgan will talk about. The components are attached to the PCB using soldering techniques. Soldering is the process of joining two or more electronic parts together by melting solder around the connection. So solder is a sort of like a metallic glue that holds the parts together and forms a connection that allows electrical current to flow. Yeah, so here's just my introduction slide. Um, so this is sort of like this, this section is sort of an introduction to so soldering and circuits. Uh, next slide. Oh, come on. There we go. Thanks. So um, today we're gonna build, I, I'm gonna show a video of me sort of building a simple function generator. So the so function generator uh, essentially just it's like an oscillator, it creates a sine wave and a triangle wave and a square wave, and those can be adjusted with a few parameters. Uh, this is a thing I got off eBay for under $10. Um, and it, it's mostly, it's, it's fairly easy to build. It only has a few parts, but it has capacitors, two different types of capacitors, resistors, potentiometers, uh, and IC. So I thought it's kind of a good start. It has some of the kind of more not harder bits, but the, the sort of things that you kind of should learn if, if you want to kind of get into doing this sort of work. And I just want to uh, keep reiterating that uh, practical experience is best. Learning by doing is you can read a lot about this, but getting hands on with this work is really the best way to practice and how to get good at it. Uh, next slide. So this is what will be covered in this video, uh, soldering basics, how to solder and desolder components, um, identifying and testing components, which is pretty important. Um, if you're gonna be trying to repair something or build something, you wanna make sure that, you know, like you can buy kits online, but sometimes they might throw in the wrong uh, piece. So you wanna test your components. 
useful tools. You know, let's just kind of go over the tools that I use in building this. And um, I, it's, you know, you really want to have the right tool for the right job. You don't want to try to jump in without the right tools. It'll make things a lot harder, if not impossible. Um, attaching cables to the output. So this is just like a, a standard, like how to um, get signal out of something that doesn't have standardized output jacks or cables, and then testing the function generator with an oscilloscope. Next slide. So what will not be covered in this is an in-depth into how circuits and electrical components actually work. Um, you know, people take like high college level engineering courses to learn that sort of stuff. Um, there are a, a number of resources online that you can kind of get a simple description of, of how these, what these components do with the purpose of them, but really like going like in depth into analyzing a circuit uh, is a little bit deeper. I think um, if people are interested, we could, I could kind of go over what the IC chip does and how it's creating these signals at sort of a higher level, which I didn't do, but I'd be interested, if anybody's interested, we could discuss that. Uh, and then also cleaning PCBs after soldering. This is something I just sort of left out. You should, uh, after doing soldering, kind of clean your PCB board with isopropyl alcohol, or it can the the rosin core of the the rosin flux core of the solder can eventually kind of eat away at the solder. Uh, for a project this size, not a big deal. Project this size and this cheap, not a big deal. But if you're working on something expensive, you'll want to make sure that you clean your board. And I just forgot to do that in the video, so I wanted to mention that that, that is also an important step. Next slide. Uh, so just quick tip, if you get started, if you start building a circuit board yourself, keep in mind that you need to be patient and confident. Nobody's born knowing how to do this. You won't be an expert on your first try. It will, you'll make mistakes and it'll, it'll, mistakes will happen. Don't let it get you down. I've bought like very expensive kits and just like ripped them apart, trying to put them together and just had to sit there and like, just be like, okay, cool. I just like threw a bunch of money down the toilet. Like it's happened. <laughs> happens all, all the time. So uh, also if you're having trouble, take a break, sleep on it. Um, it's, it, you know, it's like a really fine motor skills thing. You're really close up. You are kind of in a heightened state of awareness. If you start to get anxious or uh, impatient, it's best to just take a break and also buy extra parts. If you're going to take on like a, a large project, um, a lot of parts are very inexpensive and uh, because of that, you can just buy a few extra of, your, of the kind of critical components if you're going to do something, because then if you break a leg off of an IC, you'll have another one ready. And shipping, you know, takes like a week if you're getting something from DigiKey or Mauser. Next slide. So, oh yeah, this is just, <laughs> this is just some kind of a filler slide. Well, you can get started so that you can play the video from here. All right, in this section, I'm gonna show you the basics of uh, soldering and desoldering. So what we have here, this is called a Vero board, and it's basically just a bunch of holes on one side, and on the other side, there's a bunch of um, kind of uh, little copper pads, and this is where the solder will connect to. So the metal part that uh, a component is basically soldered to is called a pad. And on PCBs, printed circuit boards, there's usually a pad on both sides. In this case, there's just a pad on one side. Uh, in PCBs, the pad is connected to traces, and the traces are the metal uh, lines that run around that connect the components. In this case, the pads are just long. And so essentially anything that is uh, touching this line is going to be connected. Uh, and so these are set up kind of just strategically so that you can do prototyping or be uh, test out circuit uh, designs and schematics, but uh, the reason that I'm using this now is I'm using this to kind of practice to show off um, how to solder and how to desolder certain components. So um, I'm going to turn it around real quick and I'm just going to put some components just in here. I'm putting these in. These are totally at random. Uh, I'm just trying to demonstrate kind of what it looks like when you uh, pop when you're putting these in um, 
and kind of what it will look like to put them in and take them out. So I'm being fairly, uh, I'm leaving a lot of space. Um, this is a little bit more space than would be in a PCB, but I am doing this so that I, it'll be a little bit easier to demonstrate. So once I put the, uh, the lead through, I'm kind of bending it a little bit on the other side so that when I turn it upside down, it doesn't just fall out. Um, so we turn it on this side and you can see the kind of the leads kind of sticking out. And now I'm going to try to close up onto the leads that I'm soldering so that you can get a good look at what I'm doing. You've got your soldering iron, your solder, and what happens is the iron heats up the solder and it turns into liquid. The smoke rising that you see, that's uh, mostly just fumes from the uh, the rosin core of the solder melting. It's not uh, lead fumes that's going to give you lead poisoning. You don't have to worry about that. Um, there are, you know, you, you can be harmed by the fumes if you're doing this all day, every day in an unventilated room, but with proper ventilation and doing it just as a hobby, you're not going to be in too much trouble. So um, the first thing that we do is we tin the tip, which you just kind of get it a little bit wet um, with solder. And then what I like to do is heat up the pad and the lead, and then just touch the solder and it should melt. And what, ha what you really want is you're trying to get it sufficiently hot. You're trying to get the lead and the pad sufficiently hot that the solder will melt directly onto it and make a nice little uh, kind of, it kind of looks like a little pyramid or uh, if it's blobby, if it, if it's blobby or kind of balled up, it's not good. You want it to kind of be a nice little concave um, pyramid almost. So I'll do another one here. I'm heating up the pad and the lead. Touch the solder. And there, we got a nice little solder joint there. I'll do another one here. I'll do a few of these, try to make it so that I can kind of give you some light. So I'm being a little bit messy right now because I have a lot of space to work with. When you're working on a PCB, you might have a little bit less space, but this is a really good way to get started. You know, you don't want to start on a really tiny little PCB because you'll you'll be out of practice. And honestly, you, you got to have good skills to do the little PCBs. And let's do the last one over here. So again, these aren't connecting to anything. These are just, this is just for practice. Okay, so um, I might do some close-ups in post, but yeah, I get a little close and you can kind of see how that looks. Uh, these are nice and strong and they're in there. So typically after you've done this, what you would do is you cut off the leads. And I'm going to do this for the sake of realisticness. And the next thing we're going to do is desolder. Now, desoldering is the hard part. Um, it's, it's actually a very useful skill removing, uh, removing components because when you're, uh, working with old equipment, the electrolytic, the electrolytic capacitors tend to fail. Components can fail. And so you want to remove them and replace them. Now, uh, really a skilled technician should be doing this, but with enough practice and, uh, some know-how you can kind of learn to do it yourself if you don't have a technician handy. So, so here are are three components that we are going to try to remove. So you might think that it would be good. You just want to go in there, desolder and start pulling. But the thing is, it's really hard to do that because you can, unless you have like a nice, if you have a nice long soldering iron and uh, a lot of space, you can kind of heat both pads up at the same time and heat both of these up at the same time and then yank it. But usually in a PCB, you don't have a lot of room for that. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to cut these off, leaving as much space as I can up here. Then I'm going to grab, hold there. Let's see if I can line this up so that I can see and show you at the same time. Um, 
Yeah, I think this is going to work a little better. I'm going to grab onto this here. And then heat this up here. And give it a little pull. And it comes right out. Do the same here. There you go. Now, I realize this not super realistic. Sometimes you really can't get in there and clip these off because they're soldered so close to the board. And if that's the case, you're going to have to use um, this thing, this tool, which is called a solder sucker. So I'm going to push the button in, heat up the solder, and then push the release button, and that will suck in a bunch of solder. And so you'll see, um, Basically, I'm able to suck up all of the melted solder or some of it enough to uh, kind of pry the one in. So I'm going to try that with this and I'll show you how that looks. Heating this up. Oh, didn't engage it. All right, heating it up. And I'm going to do it again. Just to make sure I get as much off. I'm going to do it again. Here we go. And that might be enough for this guy to come loose. And it is. So it's come loose. And I'll show you that again with the resistor that I have in there. Let's see if we can get this in here. So I've got my solder sucker. I push the plunger down to engage it. This button will release it. When I release, all it's doing is creating a vacuum and sucking up a bunch of air. I'll do that again here. And that should be enough to get this guy loose now. There you go. So that's kind of what it looks like to desolder. Uh, here's my tool bench. Um, to show you the, the solder sucker, again, kind of in zoom out mode. Uh, when I push in, it engages. And I push this button, it disengages. If I hold my finger here, when I disengage, you'll see it doesn't come out all the way. It's because it can't suck in. There's, there's the air. I like how my finger it goes. So really what you're doing is you're pushing a plunger down. You press this button, and then it as you press the button, the plunger comes out and sucks the air out. So they make really nice ones of these that have a solder iron built into them. That's really the easiest way. So I'd say if you plan on doing some recapping and you haven't really mastered the skill yet, you can buy a nice tool that will really, really help. Uh, but that is how to solder and desolder. I would say if you want to practice this skill, get one of these guys, a little Vero board, and start just soldering a bunch of components in and then try desoldering them. Uh, that's it, this is one of those skills that you just learn by doing and doing it all the time. At this stage, um, we are going to be testing out all of the components or testing out the components that we can and have them all laid out. So as you can see here, I've laid out every single component on this piece of paper. Um, this is a really nice way to get started with any project. Um, this is a very small project, so it was fairly easy to put all these onto a single sheet of paper. Um, sometimes pro projects will have hundreds of components, and in that case, um, you may not have the time or the patience to do this, but getting started, and when you uh, have you know, a small project like this and you're just getting started, it's a really good idea to do this. So what I've got here is a multimeter. This is a multi-tool. It measures a number of different electrical uh, components and things about electrical component components. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through all of the ones that I can test and make sure that they are what they are supposed to be and what they say they are. Uh, some components um, can have be poorly made or be broken and then they won't do what they're supposed to do and then it's really hard to troubleshoot um, why something is broken when that's the case. So first to turn this on, um, there's a bunch of different modes. So one really useful mode we're not going to use right this second, but this little sound wave here, this is actually just a continuity meter. So when the, when the circuit is completed, 
it beeps. beeps. And that's a good way for checking if you maybe soldered something incorrectly and uh, you're completing a circuit that should be completed. But for now, we're gonna start by putting it in the ohm mode. And so this ohm symbol here, that is the symbol for resistance. And these parts all here are resistors. So we're gonna check that their resistance matches with what it is what it's supposed to be. So here we have R1, which is supposed to be one kilo ohm. And I pop on the pieces here and we're at uh, 0.989 kilo ohms. So that's really close. Uh, none of these components are gonna be dead on. Uh, very rare that things are dead on. Very expensive components are dead on, but these are kind of just cheap components. Uh, and that's why, you know, that's kind of the difference between a really nice piece of electronics and kind of a cheaper is that the components are cheaper and thus they'll be slightly off. But Okay, so we know that these resistors are good. So coming up here are our variable resistors. Now, uh, I'm sure you've turned a knob in your life before. So a knob, a lot of the times on electrical components, um, the, at, at its most simple, a knob is just a resistor. And you'll notice that instead of, so these have two leads, one on each end. These have three leads, one, two, three, and one, two, three. So, um, what happens is the outside two leads are always the always have the same resistance between them, and then the center uh, when you turn the knob, the uh, resistance between the center pin and the outside pins change, and the resistance between the left two pins and the right two pins is always going to add up to the total resistance. So here we have R2 and R7 that are 50 kilo ohms, and I have VAR here for variable, 50 kilo ohms variable. So if we check the two outer pins, we should get just about 50 kilo ohms there, and same here, we should get just about 50 kilo ohms here. Sorry, it's a little hard to do this. All right, and so I'll try to get a little more sturdy. 50, there's, let me get the wire out of the way for one second. All right, so we've got 51.6 and we've got 49.6. So yeah, they're off by a little bit, but they're pretty close. And then here we have R8, 100 kilo ohms variable. That should be 100. It looks like it's 109, a little high, but again, these are inexpensive components. So now to show off the kind of um, the variable portion of them, I'm not gonna test all of them just cause this is a little clunky to do, but what I'm gonna do here uh, is take my alligator clips, which are just gonna let me clip on to these guys without causing, I just have to make sure that they don't touch. You know, this is not super easy <laughs> with these. Uh, let's see, okay, I think I got it there. And then I'm gonna attach one of the alligator clips to that lead and the other alligator clip to this lead and here we can see we have 34. So if I turn all the way in this direction, I should go all the way up to 100. And if I turn all the way this direction, we go all the way down to zero or at 2.6, close enough to zero. So you can just see that the resistance changes as I turn the knob. And uh, I can't really demonstrate it very well with this example, but keep in mind that uh, when this is all the way to the right and these the resistance between the right and the center is 100 or 110 in this case uh the resistance across the bottom the middle and the left is going to be zero or close to zero and then it'll change and it'll start to go up here so that's just that's just the way that these work um you can actually interestingly on, on my voltmeter on my uh, multimeter you can see that little bar running up and down um so yeah that that's how these work so that's the resistors um the resistors all match up. I mean, again, these are a little off, but that's the magic of inexpensive electronic components. So next we have capacitors. So um, when we're looking, want to measure a capacitor, this little symbol right here uh, is a symbol for capacitor. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that. So the white symbol is a symbol for a diode and the yellow symbol is a symbol for the capacitor. So I'm going to set it to this one and then press my yellow button here and I'm now in capacitor test mode. And so what I want to do is put the leads on these capacitors. So there's capacitors here and there's capacitors here. So 
These capacitors are polarized. This leg is longer than this leg. That leg is longer than that leg. That leg is longer than that leg. The longer leg is the positive leg. These capacitors, you can't see the ends of the legs, but they have the same length of legs. These kinds of capacitors are not polarized. Uh, doesn't matter how you hook them up, they work the same. With capacitors that are polarized, it's very important that they be put in the circuit according to their proper orientation, or they will explode, actually. And I, um, the very first time I soldered a capacitor, I did it wrong and it exploded, and luckily I was wearing safety goggles. Uh, and it saved my vision. Otherwise, I, I honestly could have been pretty severely um, injured. So, um, what well, the way I have my multimeter set up, and I'll just demonstrate. I'll just show you here. So, the black is going to. It says calm here. That's common. Another word for ground. So, um, generally, if you have two leads, the red is hot, and the um, or positive, and the black is cold or ground. Um, so uh, now that we have, so we're saying red is hot and black is ground. We know that we can put the red against the positive pin and the black against the negative pin. Um, this is, it's not gonna be enough to damage it if you do this wrong, but it's good practice and it's best for your equipment and for your components. So what I have here is I'm getting 98.1 microfarads. Uh, the little U, kind of backwards U, is a, is a micro. And we have see, we see here this is 100 microfarads. So that checks out right there. Uh, next, we have C3 and C4, which are both 10 nanofarad, or 10 microfarads, sorry. And so let me just get this wire out of the way for you. Uh, we'll put this down here. And we've got 11. And we've got 11 ish so yeah so these all check out this is 100 micro and these are 10 micro so now um i'll move on to these other capacitors here again these don't matter the orientations don't matter as much but this is c2 this is so this says 104 on it sorry one second let me adjust the microphone so you really can't see it's very difficult to see i'll try to show a close-up of this but this is 104 right here uh on it this says 105 that's what i have in quotes is what's actually printed on it uh that's the capacitor code essentially uh what you the way that you read that is the first number here is the first digit of the value this is the second digit of the value and then this is the multiplier of the value um, I'll show you a chart for that, but 104 translates into 100 nanofarads. And if I do this here, you'll see I have 95 nanofarads. Uh, it's maybe hard for you to see, but the uh, kind of the scale, uh, the value of the digits, it shows up right here. This says NF nanofarads. And so we've got um, about 100 here, 96. And I actually cannot measure this last one, 100 picofarads. That cannot be measured with this uh, tool. Tool is just not uh, power, not uh, detailed enough to get that. So, uh, fortunately, that's just the way the cookie crumbles on that. So, um, that is us now having tested all of our components that are testable. We've tested them and we know they're good. So we're kind of good to move on. Uh, before we continue, I'm going to show you here. This is uh, a XR2206 IC, it's essentially a signal generating IC. So an IC is an integrated circuit. Anytime you see uh, one of these little kind of black bars with a lot of little pins sticking out of it, that's an integrated circuit. They do a number of things. Uh, essentially, if you want to know more about what it does, you look up the number and you can find the data sheet online. Um, some people, you know, have these memorized, but you're not going to be able to tell what it does unless you look it up or you have the numbers memorized. But uh, they can be amplifiers, they can be timers, they can be delay chips, they can be filters, they can be uh, oscillators, they can be any number of things. In this case, what we have is we have a generator. It's essentially an oscillator. It's, it's going to be uh, creating the signal. Um, then this right here is a socket. Uh, it's not a good idea to solder these guys directly into your board because if you make a mistake it's really hard to get out so what you want to do is you have the socket and then you can pop these in and out as needed right here is just some headers all this is is literally just some leads 
and um, they're uh, we'll I'll demonstrate later. We know what they do, what we do with them. These are jumpers. What what we're going to do here is kind of just connect these leads with these jumpers, and that's uh, how the settings on this thing work. You basically adjust the settings and the frequency range with the jumpers. Right here is a signal terminal. So this is the output actually. Um, if you saw my webinar on uh, terminal connections, this is a similar kind of just a kind of a different shape. But basically, you have these three outputs, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect a cable to these so that the easier to come out of but again this is sort of a cheap device it doesn't have a nice standardized cable the power the uh, the wave signal is going to come out of this and then here's our dc jack this is just what we plug into power um and this works with any 9 to 12 volt uh, power adapter dc power adapter and i've read online that the 9 volts works best so that's it we've tested let's move on Okay, so now we're getting started on the part where we're actually going to start building the circuit. So um, I just wanted to lay out the tools that I'm going to use here um, and talk about them for a second. So here I've got some needle nose pliers. Um, this is just good because these are these are really nice and long and slender, so I can really get into little parts to bend something or to take a component out if I screw it up. Uh, these are little snippers. Um, these are really nice because, uh, as you can see, these leads are kind of long. And when I pop something in and, and, and it's done, I'm going to snip the end off. Uh, and that'll make it, uh, yeah, nice and have the ends be short so they're not touching each other. Here's uh, wire strippers. I might not actually need these, but I like to have these around if I have to strip some wires. Uh, this is a solder sucker. Basically what it does is um, you pop it in and then it makes a vacuum. So if I press this button, it kind of sucks the air in so you can see if i put my finger on the top and i press the button it doesn't retract all the way because i've created a vacuum and what you do is you use this to, to suck up any solder that um you has kind of like built up if you need to remove something and then here we go we have some solder here so solder is uh half is lead and rosin um this is rosin core. This is a 2% flux core solder wire. So uh, basically the, the lead melts, the, the rosin inside of it is what helps it stick to the metal. Um, there is lead-free solder out there. It doesn't work very well. It's very hard to use. Uh, I really would suggest getting the leaded stuff. I really like this blend here, uh, which is, I don't know if you can see this, but it is SN63PB37. Great stuff. Uh, okay, and then of course I've got here I've got my soldering iron. So what's great about this little setup that I have here with the soldering iron is I've got this tip cleaner material. Let's see if you can see this. So what this does is when the tip gets all uh, gunky and screwy, I can pop it in here. And this stuff, there's a bunch of rosin in the bottom, and these uh, kind of uh, these braids that are coated in rosin, and it makes the tip nice and clean. So that's what I'm going to use, uh, kind of between if when I make a mess, inevitably make a mess with the solder. That's what I'm going to do. So then, what I've also got here is the circuit. So it's my PCB printed circuit board, and I've got. This right here is called a helping hand. Uh, this thing is extremely useful, especially because uh, I can use it to turn the circuit around and print the, turn the PCB around, get onto the bottom, can easily switch between it being, <laughs> sorry, on the bottom or the top, and it holds it nice and steady for me. Uh, you can uh, do projects without these. Um, I've done many projects without these, but uh, wow, they're very, very helpful. So I've got my pieces all here, ready to go. Let's get started. The first thing that you want to do is identify, you know, the parts that, sh that need to be soldered. So we can just go in order. I've got that sheet, as you remember, that had the uh, the components labeled. So I like to start with the resistors. The resistors are small and they're just going to kind of sit um, 
very close to the board. Uh, a lot of instructions will tell you start with things that are small and that are going to sit across the board. So you, the resistors, you can see they have that little shape like that. There's a, that's where a resistor is going to go. That's where a resistor is going to go. There's some resistors that are going to go there and there. And starting with R1, finding R1, there's R1 right there. And we have R1 in our little piece of paper that we can grab. Um, so let's get started with R1. All right, so we're going to pop R1 into, there we go, sorry, try to stay out of your way. So now we've got R1 in there. If I'm going to disconnect this, I'm going to turn this around so you can see the back side. And what I like to do is kind of stretch them out like that. So, um, we got the two ends there and there, kind of get them stretched out so that it can stick itself kind of stays in there and then we got to do the soldering so all right so i'm tinning my tip and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to heat up so the circular little the little metal circular bit that's here that's kind of in uh, in the hole that's the pad that's referred to as a pad and i'm going to heat up the pad and the leg and then my solder should just melt nicely to both and I'll do it over here too. And there, as you can see, we've got a nice little soldered bit, the soldered joint right there. Then I'm gonna take my clippers, clip there, and clip there. And we've got our first resistor in, right there. All right, look, now we have all five resistors soldered on. All right, so coming up next, we're gonna do the capacitors. Um, all right, so here's the here's one of the capacitors. This is C1, this is 100 nanofarads, or uh, 100 microfarads, I'm sorry. And you should be able to, if I can get the camera to focus, see it right there, it says 100 microfarads, again, we have the longer leg is the positive leg. So this is C1. We're going to find C1, which is right here, right there. And the positive leg is going to go in. Um, excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I need to figure out where the positive leg goes. Uh, I believe the positive side is going to be the dark side, but uh, let's take a pause and figure that out with these diagrams. I'm used to the uh, diagram having on it either positive or negative, not uh, dark or light. Okay, so I did a quick Google search and saw that the shaded side is the positive side. So we're going to take the long leg again here so you can see one leg is long and one leg is short and we're going to make sure that the long leg goes in like that and and i'm going to stretch the legs out a little bit on the back side so when i turn them around ooh. See, I just made a little solder bridge there. So that's a good lesson. So you see, I kind of connected those two together by being messy. So that's why I've got this. So I'm gonna get the solder sucker put right here, heat this up, pull the trigger, and I've now kind of unbridged that connection. You can see there's no longer solder connecting those two. Cool. What's next? Let's do the little the other capacitors. So the other capacitors are all going to go here-ish. You can see these 
when you have the capacitor symbol with the two lines like that, that means that again they don't they're not polarized in any way. So we just have to make sure that they go in the right spot. So I'm gonna grab C2 and C2 is gonna go right there. So let's pop C2 in. And then I'm going to stretch the legs out on the back. And there we go, C2 is in. And these guys tend to be a little loosey. So I'm just loose rather. I'm just gonna just be really careful when I turn them upside down. Um, I don't want them to fall out. That would be a real pain. Um, I will show you a trick later on how to, with kind of other pieces of electronics and how we can kind of keep them in. Uh, so as you can, you may be able to see all the kind of leads coming out there. So now I'm gonna ride up and kind of just start soldering all those leads. This one right here is not super strong right there. So I'm gonna just get in there with the soldering iron, give it another go. Um, I can kind of bend these leads out of the way a little bit now that uh, they're soldered in slightly. Um, there we go. All right, so now they all look uh, nice and strong. <laughs> this one's a little ugly. Uh, sorry, my soldering skill is, again, this is like tying somebody else's shoes a little bit. Uh, so now I'm going to clip these all off. Uh, that one that I said that I fixed is, is uh, it's still a little ugly. So this is kind of tricky, but I'm going to try to get in there and fix it up a little. All right, it's just a little a little nicer now. Not quite as ugly. Um, so now, I turn this back around. I have now got almost all of the smaller components in there. So I've got all of our, all right, I've got our resistors, our capacitors. So the next step is gonna be staining stain stuff with low profile. I'm gonna put in the socket. And, the IC socket, and that's gonna go right here. So what's cool about the way that they print the, uh, the screen print the circuit board is that you'll notice this guy has a little crescent moon at the top, and that matches the little crescent moon, the little indent at the top of the screen print. It can be a little difficult to see. If you can see there, I'll try to make that obvious. So the bottom you can see is flat, and then this has a little crest. The bottom is flat down here, and the crescent moon is right up there, and that matches the little crescent moon right there in the bottom. So I'm going to pop this in like so, orient it like so. Come on. Oh, and the reason it's not going in, of course, is because there's two bent pins. So I gotta bend those pins back into place. Uh, these pins are rather fragile. So then let's give it another go and be a little more gentle this time. Uh, I'm going to just disconnect this and do it close to my face. All right, now that I've got it in, uh, what I'm going to do is take a piece of that blue tape that I've been using, this kind of painter's tape, and I'm just going to use that to hold this in place because otherwise it's going to fall out when I turn this upside down. So now I can turn it upside down and it is still in there because of the tape. And now I'm gonna go through and solder it. Um, without that, the reason I like to use that blue tape is that it's low tack. 
and it's not going to leave any um, kind of goop or gunk behind. Now let's get in here. Okay, I've got that done. That was probably the biggest one that's going to happen this whole time. All right, so I'll turn this back around, take the tape off, nice and in there. Um, and now I can just actually pop that IC. Well, you know what? I'm not going to put the IC yet. I like to wait until we do all the soldering to do the ICs because they get um, they can be damaged very easily. So the next thing I can do is populate this little header board right here. And I'm gonna pop that in. All right, so we've got the headers there. Again, I'm gonna do the same thing I did before with the piece of tape. I'm gonna tape this guy down. And that is because it'll just fall out if I don't have it taped in. But this tape isn't gonna leave behind any gunk. So now I've taped that down. Let's turn it around. Right, got it right here. I gotta make sure the tape keeps it nice and flush or else it's gonna be really tough to solder in. So th these kinds of little physical problems, these are these are sort of the some of the harder parts about doing this sort of work is just making sure that you can keep your, kind of keep everything physically organized and well aligned. All right, I got those all soldered in. Um, let's turn this around and make sure it's nice and sturdy. Get this out. Alrighty. Um, I was cutting it pretty close with that, but these are in. You can see there's a lot of like, clearance there, but they are in there. So we should be good. All right, let's do it again with the smaller one here. That's going to go right here. And let's tape it down. Um, now uh, we have only a few things left to do. So let's start with the signal terminal. So we can pop that in. So we, the way we want to orient the signal terminal is uh, we want the these kind of silvery bits where we're going to connect the wires to face out of the board. It's away from the board. So I'm going to pop it in there. And yet again, I need to use a piece of tape to hold that down. All right, moving on. What's next? We've got uh, the DC jack. So the DC jack is set to go right here. Pop it in. Get a piece of tape ready. All right, and that's it for the jack. It's now in, nice and solid. So we've got these resistors right here. So we've got R2, R7, and R8. Those line up with R2, R7, and R8. So we can pop these in. Now these have these little kind of hook guys that make them stay in when you put them in. Well, they usually stay in, not these. I can, I'm going to kind of push, pull the metal out just a little bit, and that'll help it stay in a little better. I might need to do the tape trick with these two. So 
So I've got the leads soldered in now. And then these big chunks right here can be soldered in. They're basically just support so that the user can um, kind of yank on them and they don't get damaged. Um, but it's good to solder that in too. So we have completed putting the circuit, uh, soldering everything together. The last thing to do is going to be to pop this guy on. And so the reason I was talking about that crescent moon earlier is there's, there is that little crescent moon right there at the top. So this bottom part is flat and that top part has the crescent moon. And that's how you know how to orient this when you pop it in. And these legs, I'll tell you what, they can be a bit of a pain. So what I like to usually do is kind of push them in slightly, not too much, or else you'll destroy them, which I'm on my way to doing. Uh, you have to be very gentle with these. If you break a leg off of these, you're kind of sunk until you buy another one that comes in the mail a week later. So get them all in and they pop right in. And it's always good to do a double check and make sure that all the legs are in there and that they didn't get bent up. Well, now that I've soldered everything together, we're gonna pop it into the case. So, remember how earlier I said that if you don't put electrolytic capacitors incorrectly, they explode. Well, it happened. Uh, the one internet resource that I looked up to see if the shaded side is positive or negative was incorrect. And uh, according to some other resources, the shaded side is, or sorry, the, the resource I saw said the shaded side is positive. However, the actual orientation is that the shaded side should be negative. And we know this because I plugged the shaded side in as positive and this capacitor exploded and that fuzzy stuff that's all over, that's the inside of the capacitor. So um, that's no good. Uh, this capacitor is now useless. Um, let's see, we just kind of pop it off altogether. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna carefully take all three capacitors out Uh, it is now, I'm not going to show you, you know, how I did this, but it's, uh, it's all assembled now and it fit together. It's just pieces of plastic screwed together. But, uh, so this is the output right here. But again, as we had discussed, this isn't really a super, uh, normal output. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this cable and I'm going to rip it apart and show you how to get it out. So this is sort of similar to the last workshop that I had done about the uh, 575. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my snippers and snip this end off. And now I've got two RCA female connectors. These are pretty useful. And then what I'm going to do is, um, let's see, like I, I need, you know, a good amount I don't really need a ton, but, um, so I'm gonna get myself some, uh, got the leads here. So I've got, uh, this, the braided cable that is on the outside here. That's gonna be the ground. That's connected to the ring here, which is the ground. And now I need to kind of get some to adjust this so that it closes a little smaller. And there we've got one of them like that. Uh, and then also I'm gonna do two at the same time. I'm gonna have two coming in. So I don't know if you, if you can see here, this says ground sine or ground square sine triangle. So the way that this works is 
this is the common ground. This terminal is going to send out the square wave signal, and this this terminal is going to send out the sine and triangle signal. And you switch the sine and the triangle signal between those two using that little guy here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one of these send the square, one of these send the sine sin, uh, the sine triangle. And in order to do that, I want to have their grounds connected. So I'm going to make another one here. Um, and so let's see here. Do braiding this up and we've got so now we've got these two and the grounds yeah. all grounds in general are connected to each other. So I'm gonna actually go ahead and just connect the grounds here and that way I don't have to worry about you know, the grounds are now just connected to one common lead, this here, and then this white one is connected to the black cable and this yellow one's connected to the red guy. Uh, and as I had, again, this is maybe a little bit of a refresher, but I am going to pin the, these tips. Uh, first, I'm gonna just kind of Tie them together. I'm just uh, what I'm doing is I'm just twisting the ends so that the ends don't fray. When you get frayed ends, it really um, is a big pain. Uh, this is I'm sorry if this is just kind of a weird thing to record on video. I'm not quite getting it. All right, here we go. So I've got my soldering iron and I've got my solder. Uh, it's heating up right now. There we go. It's heated up. All right. So now when I have the, that, I'm going to just, just I'm going to set this here. So it's just a little bit raised off. Um, what, what I'm doing here is I just want to raise the cable slightly so I don't burn my tablecloth. And then I'm just going to wipe some solder on here. And this is just for structural integrity. This isn't required by any means, but it's really helpful when you're working with these terminal connectors. See, I just kind of bumped these and they frayed. And it's really hard to get stuff in the terminal connectors when it's frayed like that. So that's why I'm just gonna tin them up like that. And they'll have a lot more structural integrity. Once I've done that. Okay. Okay. So I need these screwdrivers because these screws are very small and this is the special sm small set of screwdrivers. So I'm gonna pop this open, grab this guy right here and it looks like that fits. All right. So as I, so this is the ground, as I unscrew, it sort of loosens that makes a space for me to pop this guy into, and then I can tighten it. And now that's nice and sturdy. So next I'm gonna put the white cable from the, I'm gonna put the white lead in the square. <laughs> it's gonna be a little tough. get that and show you at the same time and put the red as a yellow lead into here get those in and then screw it in nice and tight Um, and I'm going to use these handy dandy, extremely slender needle nose pliers. Sorry if this isn't exactly the clearest view. All right. Got that in there. Screwing it in. All right. And now I've got my connections. So this black one is going to send out the square wave. This red one is going to send the sine or triangle wave. And now let's hook it up to the waveform monitor.
uh, right now, what we're looking at is we're looking at the square wave and the sine wave in an oscilloscope. So I've got the square wave hooked up here, the sine wave hooked up here. The sine wave is going into channel one of the oscilloscope and the square wave is going into channel two of the oscilloscope. So channel two, I can adjust size, the amplitude there, or the, the, sco the scale there, and uh, the channel one, the sine wave, I can adjust the scale here. So as you can see, they're in sync with each other. This is just has one clock. The one clock is generating both of the waves, and I can adjust the amplitude of the sine wave, and I can adjust the frequency, and yeah, it's so basically that's adjusting the frequency, uh, the coarse adjustment, and then this is the fine adjustment. So um, it, you can see it's kind of hard to get it to really kind of sync up with the scope. And that's what's a, one really interesting thing about this. So one thing is one way we can view both the channels, the, the sine wave channel and the square wave channel, at the same time, but it's kind of hard to sync up, or we can use the square wave channel. So uh, real quick, the square wave, it just looks like, you know, a high and a low, and you're not seeing like the, the rise and the fall. That's because this just, it goes down so fast, it doesn't have a line. It's just kind of um, high, low, high, low, high, low. And then this is kind of, they're going at the same frequency, but they're different wave shapes. So you can use the square wave as an actual external reference for the scope. So let's show you what that looks like. I'm gonna take the square wave from the channel two in and put it into the external reference. And you see it locks up. So I'm gonna turn off uh, channel two view right now and we'll just view channel one. And now the scope timing is being, the scope is being timed by that square wave pulse, which is at the same frequency as the sine wave. And now it's always gonna be locked up. So now when I adjust the frequency and I make the frequency higher, you see it's, it's actually um, affecting the wave. And it, that's like basically too fine for you to see. And I can adjust the frequency coarse adjustment here, fine adjustment here, and the amplitude adjustment here. But you know, this is, there's not really too much to look at here. I just kind of want to show you that we made a working tool that is working as expected. Um, even after the capacitors blew up and we had that problem, we were able to put it back together and get it working. So it is doable. And a little kit like this can be really helpful in kind of teaching you how to solder. Awesome. That was fantastic. Thank you, Morgan, so much. Uh, Blake, I want to throw it over to you now, um, since I know we're uh, running a little low on time. But um, I don't know, Blake, did you have any uh, slides or anything? I do. I, I do. I have them up on my computer and I will right, show you my make screen. Sure that I have and you are able to share. Do you have a see a share button? Yes, I do. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So I will share my screen. And welcome to Amateur Hour. Uh, let's see. Let me... Favorite. <laughs> so uh, as very much noted by my qualifications here, I'm not an electrician. I'm not a professional at any of this. So thank you, Morgan, for your introduction. That was really great. Um, but I think I'm going, to, I don't have a whole lot of resources to share for stuff because I'm pretty self-taught in all of this, but Electronics Point is a good one that I'll talk about in a second here. They have forums if you have any questions. Um, you know, that was one place that really helped me sourcing uh, diodes that were obsolete and they didn't manufacture anymore and sourcing parts that were compatible with my old circuit boards that I will go into in a second here. Um, vinyl engine and hi-fi engine, if you have anything like that in your memory lab, I have a reel-to-reel -reel machine that was made in 1970 that I had to source the uh, the service manual from along with a uh, uh, along with another turntable which I will get into. What I'm really going to talk about is just kind of working on old stuff kind of and then Google also really helps a lot you know odds are if you have an issue working with this old legacy equipment somebody else is going to have the exact same issue that you have or had 
So that'll really help you. Sometimes you'll find some old forum post from 2008 that's where someone had your issue and they fixed it. And sometimes they'll say they fixed it and won't tell you how. So that's always fun. Uh, and then the lessons learned for me, learning to do this as an amateur, um, don't be afraid to take stuff apart. Um, I put something down there. If it's already broken, if you've written it off or if your institution has written it off, there's no way to make it more broken than it already is. If it's already useless, there's nothing to be lost in trying to fix it. Best case scenario, you've learned learned something about working on electronics and you've got a valuable lesson out of it. And worst case scenario, it's still broken. You know, there's nothing you can really, you really can't break it worse than it already is, especially if you, if you or your institution have already written it off. Um, you want to look for adjustable parts. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. If you want to look for something that might be able to take a screwdriver or anything like that, or is, is removable, uh, Something like that, sometimes you will find that if something's not working the exact way it should, something might be out of calibration. And uh, you want to look for anything out of place. And I'll show you pictures of that, too, uh, kind of going into that. And then the last thing is help is out there with, like, the forums that I shared. You know, there's the great thing about the Internet is now there are, there are resources going lore out there and especially if you're working on legacy equipment odds are there's a schematic or a service manual or something like that so the first thing that i ever actually worked on was a is, was an amplifier i'm a musician and so i was able to get this ancient 1983 amplifier not this exact one but it's the same model and it had led a very hard life and one of the shafts for the potentiometers on one of here was broken off completely which required me to uh, open it up and desolder from the PCB. This was not a lug mounted um, potentiometer. This was a sur surface mounted potentiometer, which had pins, which was terrifying because I'd never soldered to a PCB before, <laughs> but the amplifier was $50. And so I had to contact Fender, which owned the company. And they were like, we don't have any information about this particular amplifier because it was made nearly 40 years ago, but we do have a schematic from our archive. So they sent me this schematic and I was able to figure out what part went wrong, but I didn't know what kind of part to order. So I reached out to that forum that I shared <clears throat> electronics point and they guided me to which potentiometers had the correct value. And then I proceeded to solder those in. And as Morgan said, parts are very inexpensive. The, you know, the potentiometer was like $2 and capacitors are, I think the last time I ordered capacitors, they were something like six cents a piece. They're, they are incredibly affordable. And now moving on, uh, Morgan was talking about uh, exploding electrolytic capacitors. And you might also uh, experience this. This is from a turntable of mine. And I, this was my second uh, like baptism by fire and repairing electronics because I kind of wanted to get into vinyl, but I was pretty broke. And a guy who volunteered at the library said, I have three broken turntables in my basement if you want to try working on any of them. And I said, sure. And so he gave me these old turntables and this is out of one of them. And if you look very clearly, there is a bunch of black gunk that has leaked out of those electrolytic capacitors. And that is just acid that was housed in them failing over the period. I think this uh, turntable was from the late 70s. And so that required, you know, and it didn't work at all because this acid had leaked all over the circuit board. And that's another thing, looking for stuff that's out of place. You know, if you're if something's not working, if you open it up and you see something like this, then it's pretty clear that that's probably relating to your issue. So you'll see that there is acid that has leaked all over the circuit board and covered one of the uh, resistors there and another diode there with a, uh, just with that gunk. And so I desoldered and cleaned off that acid. And you can see that in the process of cleaning that acid, the, um, there were two diodes that actually failed. They were covered in glass, which was interesting. And so you can see the orange one right there in the foreground snapped entirely. And there's a red one towards the top that, uh, really that also failed and 
The other thing that I've noticed with working on old electronics, if you can find a service manual, the really nice thing about the circuit boards is that they give you all the information you really need to know. So you'll see that all the parts are numbered. You have capacitor 822 and 823, the C822 and C823 down there at the bottom. And those really, uh, that the circuit or the, uh, and those also have marked which side is positive and which is negative. If you look at the uh, at the half moon thing down there, the wipe section, I can't remember which side was which. <clears throat> I used my uh, the picture that I took as reference to remember which uh, which side of the capacitor was positive and negative. But that was one thing that I had to do was cleaning. And that's one thing you'll probably have to do as well is making sure you clean all this acid off. So I ended up uh, cleaning all the acid off that I could and then replacing the two broken diodes and it worked. And that just kind of goes back into don't be afraid to work on stuff. You know, it, it, it didn't work before. And if I hadn't fixed it, I didn't work after. And I really wasn't out a whole lot of money. I was out $5, I think for all the parts with shipping. So you're really, don't need to be afraid of electronics. <clears throat> it's, and I and I know Morgan said you have a trusted technician work on it, and I'm I'm not any kind of professional technician, but I did it and I lived, so I, uh, I think you'll be pretty okay. And then, <clears throat> and sometimes what's also really nice is that you'll get a flow chart in the service manual. This is actually the flow chart. Uh, from that turntable circuit board that I just showed you. And so if you can get a hold of service manuals, then um, it really, your job really isn't that hard working on stuff. You know, it, uh, soldering is a really good technique to know, but the actual act of doing is really not all that difficult once you get a little bit into it, I think anyway, you know, if, because these flow charts are pretty clear, you know, if the platter doesn't rotate, but it does rotate when you bridge this pin and this pin with a set of alligator clips, then you know that this part is the one that went wrong. So it's, these aren't some kind of, they look very intimidating when you first open them up, but they really aren't all that crazy when you really get into them. <clears throat> and so we're gonna talk a little bit about applying this to the memory lab now. And, the biggest one, and this is a really horrible picture because I couldn't find a higher quality copy of it. I downloaded this off of the Slack channel. But uh, one of the other cohort members was having issues with their time base corrector because they couldn't get an S video cable to work and work with it. Whereas a previous uh, member from uh, who's not really, who the employees who set it up are no longer involved with the Slack channel from what I've seen. They were able to get it working, but they didn't leave behind what they did to make it work. So if you look there, it's horribly pixelated, but bear with me. You can see that I have circled in red or squared out in red a uh, part that says Y out CVS, which I assume stands for composite video signal. And if you look on the metal barrels to the right, you'll see that they're um, each one of those parts is labeled, which says, one says CVS slash Y out, and the other one says chroma out, which um, the CVS out is your composite video signal. And if you look at the part that I highlighted, and I think there's a higher quality picture on the Slack channel if you are interested in looking. Um, if you look at the part highlighted in red, it says Y out CVS, and you can't really tell from the picture, but there is actually a removable cover on top of that, that you can take off with a metal jumper in the middle of it, that you can then shift over to bridge the Y in the out and bypass that composite video signal to use the uh, proper color and chroma separation for S video. So that just goes back to opening it up and looking for something that you that looks like you can take it apart or gently nudge into place. You know, you don't want to force anything, of course, but you kind of want to look and see, you know, can I twist this? Can I lift this? Can, will it slide? Anything like that? Because chances are, if it does, then it was probably meant to. And uh, there was an S video, not an S video, uh, a umatic deck that was donated to us that uh, had an embarrassment of small adjustable potentiometers inside it that um, really, that did a little bit, but not enough to fix my issues. <laughs> 
So I think that's about it. Oh, and a VCR that we had broken. And this goes back to the service manual. This isn't as much related to the circuit board, but um, our VCR died and is still dead because we want to get it fixed when there will be people under people using it so that we will have the warranty. And if it breaks while people are using it, we can get it fixed. But you just want to open stuff up. And I was able to determine from the service manual that this piece that broke is related to the piece that I circled in red. So I think this is my last slide, but uh, like I said, or uh, like Siobhan said, we're running low on time. And so I kind of condensed this a lot, but uh, the biggest thing is don't be afraid to open stuff up and look at it because you're not really, if it's already broken and it needs to be looked at, you're not probably not gonna make it any more broken than it already is. And I think that's about all I have. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Blake, so much. Uh, thank you, Morgan, so much. I uh, am just, and thank you, Jonathan, for hanging. I know Amy had to go, but um, yeah. Uh, I feel like I have, I have a few questions. Um, and I mean, we only have four minutes until like 90 minutes ticks in, but if you guys are cool, just chatting. Um, no, we're good, I'm good. Uh, um, so just to, since Blake, since you just ended, I guess I'll I'll start there with the um, so and Morgan, I was talking to, to with you about this the other day about so the part that Blake just showed from from their VCR, yeah. that's the Panasonic AG nineteen eighty, right, Blake? Yep. Yeah. Oh. Um, so I I need to of course I haven't been in the office in a gazillion years, but um, I need to find our Panasonic AG1980 that, that broke and see if it's the same issue. Because um, if it's something that is prone to this deck, it's something that we should put into AV Kid, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's not, that's not the piece that I'm used to breaking. Uh, mm -hmm. Or what, what, what we have is there's, they, there's a big like piece of plastic that's about this big that has a bunch of like kind of holes milled into it and it's kind of what moves stuff around mm. it's kind of like a big gear shift mm -hmm. and that basically just kind of wears down and uh the data doesn't shift well anymore so that that's what i'm used to breaking so we've just gotten to the point where we open that up and like kind of sand it down and it seems to help but okay. i haven't seen that like that broken paddle yeah. yeah, I I'm not entirely sure. I opened up the VCR. I I, I had a difficult time finding exactly where that piece broke. Um, if you like, I can share my screen right. again here so you can see the. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So, um, the the circled the black circled areas are the pieces that seem obviously snapped off. And the yeah. what I couldn't really see what had broken. It was difficult underneath all the other structural pieces and additional PCBs and everything. But what that large plastic piece does is it slides back and forth and it causes the arms to move to engage the tape. Yes. Mm. And yeah, so yeah, that is that one in the red circle is the one that breaks. The so I'm not entirely is, sure if that piece is actually broken or not. It looked fine to me. But because if you look at the um, at the piece that I photographed, there's a there's some grease on that pin, so it moves. Mm -hmm. So I'm not entirely positive yeah. where that broken. I, like I said, I can't exactly see it on the on that exploded parts view, and I haven't broken it <laughs> yeah, no. um, that much because my, my supervisor wanted me to limit my time on it, but yeah. It's been, it's been a second since I've been in one of these, but that part in the red circle is like that kind of gear shift kind of thing. It, 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 yeah, that moves the arms. And so it looks like the part on the left that you have just fits into one of those slots and moves mm -hmm. around and that's got the grease on it. So it might actually be a problem more so with that bigger piece that then snapped off the smaller piece. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense that would square with my experience gotcha i don't know where I, and i also equally can't figure out where that smaller piece would go just from the diagram right yeah 
Jonathan, you have you have a broken, busted VCR. Uh, yeah, just real quick. Uh, I, I have to leave here, but yeah, it's, uh, I got a donated VCR and we put a tape in and then the tape won't come out. So I know it has to do something with the mechanism that'll pop it out. It's not a, it's just like a cheapo consumer deck, but yeah. it's probably the first VCR we got donated. So it's just sitting on a shelf and I just have to kind of, I'm, I'm always afraid of going in there and prying stuff out, but I'm afraid that's what's going to happen or because it's a cheapo consumer deck, I might just call it a loss and go, well, yeah. you know, just throw it away. Or, or yeah, use it. it to learn, you know, it could be your like the, the thing that you open up to kind of learn a bit more about and not feel bad about breaking anything, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, totally. Well, thank you for coming, Jonathan. Good to see you. Uh, good to see everyone, and thanks for the info again. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be soldering anytime soon, but um, <laughs> it's uh, very informative. And if I could track down that soldering iron that we mysteriously found in our branch, then I'll probably <laughs> practice with it. There you go. Yeah. Cool. It was the most random thing. We we you know we find all kinds of other stuff, but a soldering iron. <laughs> yeah. just, don't know. But uh, again, yeah, thanks again. Cool. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Well, it's just us now. <laughs> but um, I do still have questions. And since it's being recorded, I think, and I, a lot of people are really tuning in at their leisure. So um, can I ask a few more questions for you guys? Sure. OK. Uh, Blake, how exactly did you clean that acid off? Did you have like an, an electronics vacuum that you used, or you just were like, eh? Q -tip. I used um, I used rubbing alcohol in a Q-tip. Gotcha. Perfect. Okay. Tried and true method. <laughs> and then um, Morgan, the so the the PCB that you you put together, um, so that was specifically intended to just send those signals of the sine wave and the square, um, right? And to like you know and to modify them a little bit but send them out and just do yes. a few things uh okay just wanted to make sure that uh, yeah i should have made that more clear it's just a simple wave generator essentially and i i didn't want to go too much into oscilloscopes and stuff but i wanted to show how you can use a square wave to sync the oscilloscope up so that right. it uh just like i i've heard a bunch of people talk about like an intro to oscilloscopes would be good so that was kind of like an intro that would be really great yeah and <laughs> The oscilloscope for folks that was the white piece of machinery that has like the little TV that you were seeing all the yeah yeah too. yeah but yeah it's it's just a all, you know you can use that scope or, or rather that function generator to test equipment it could be used to test equipment if you needed to like check the frequency response or something it's not but it's not really a scientific tool it's more just like a, a little toy that you can build right um, right the pcb that you had yeah yeah cool it was cute yeah it was nice <laughs> I've, still one, got, I've got it sitting around somewhere yeah here it is one thing that just came to my mind actually randomly about cleaning mm -hmm. um another thing that what is also useful is that aerosol electronics cleaner mm. i don't remember you know it goes under a bunch of different names uh yes. morgan i can guarantee probably has some um, but that was another thing that was exactly, uh, the, the, that turntable that I fixed had a switch that would differentiate between 45 and 33 RPM. And the switch only played at 40 or the record player only played at 45 RPM because that switch, since it was old had oxidized. And so I had to flood that switch with the deoxid and get it to work again because oh, awesome. there was nothing really structurally wrong with it. It was just old and cruddy. Right, 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 right. See, that's the thing that I am really excited about all this to, you know, imp for people to implement to help them keep their memory labs running. Uh, and, you know, since VCRs and these, many of these pieces of equipment are no longer manufactured, you know, they're eventually we're going to have to start really doing DIYing a lot of mm -hmm. the Yep. maintenance uh, and repairs. So, um, the, and this is something, Morgan, I mean, like the, you know, you mentioned a little bit about, about things that you might notice when you like, you know, 
come across a VCR and I think you said it was capacitors that are going to be the things that you check first, right? And then see if they're, if they're messed up, you replace them. You know, I know that you said that you're maybe going to do like a checklist. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I want to do something with that. I mean, so to talk about the capacitors, what happens is electrolytic capacitors just generally have like a shorter life than most components. And when they, uh, when they fail, they end up making sort of a low pass filter, which basically is allowing low, if you have a signal, your video signal going through a bunch of these capacitors, uh, your signal is made up of low frequencies and high frequencies. And if the high frequencies are getting cut off or attenuated, you end up having sort of a softer image. Uh, the way to think about this is that um, higher frequencies are details. So like imagine if you have like a low bandwidth signal that has very little detail, a, the higher bandwidth your signal has, the more fine details you mm -hmm. can uh, represent and, and reproduce. So when the capacitors turn into a low pass filter, when they fail, which is a, a common failure mode for them, uh, you're losing the high frequencies and in turn are losing fine grain detail in your video signal. So it's not always the case. I just have seen this happen. There's in particular, there's like a professional high eight deck that works really well, except that the capacitors on it are prone to failure and you end up getting this soft image on it. Even though it's a nice deck, the image gets soft uh, and you can just replace the capacitors, but those are surface mount capacitors. So those are actually pretty tough to replace, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, like, I wouldn't suggest just going in and replacing the capacitors on something, but um, uh, if you do that thing, it kind of throws stuff out of alignment a little bit, but it's still a good place to start if you're having sort of like a soft image or, or power issues, capacitors are like the first thing to go essentially. Gotcha, gotcha. Are, is there anywhere like on a PCB, like I don't, it, you know, is there anything you shouldn't touch? <laughs> Don't touch anything near the power supply. You, with, yeah. with, so, so with, yeah, always never touch anything when anything's plugged in, for mm -hmm. sure. There is like, if you kind of look in like the circuit bending community, um, if something is plugged into a wall wart that is like a feeding like a DC signal, um, then it's safe to touch when it's plugged in and people will like, create like, you know, hacked instruments that they kind of like toy with while they're plugged in to see what they do. But still don't do that unless you know what you're doing. Um, if something's plugged into the wall with like just an AC plug, do not go in there while it's plugged in. And if it has really big capacitors in it, make sure it's unplugged for a while before going in because the capacitors need to discharge. Uh, like a CRT monitor has these huge capacitors and that can take like a week to discharge. So you, you don't want to open up a CRT. I would suggest unless you really know what you're doing, do not open up a CRT monitor yeah. or uh, a, a scope. Th those, mm -hmm. are, those are really dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, um, gener so generally like what happens is the uh, electronics will have like pro decks will have a power supply in them with the transformer and the transformer steps down the voltage and the amperage to a usable level from the wall signal to your circuit board. So anything that's past the transformer is generally safe. Mm -hmm. um, anything before the transformer is safe if it's if it's unplugged and the capacitor dis are, are discharged and stuff. So just unless you're really confident, don't mess with anything before the transformer and in the power part of it. But usually, especially with pro equipment, um, and, and consumer equipment too, generally the, there's like a, there's space between it and, and there's a fair dis amount of distinction between where it's the power and where it's like the kind of signal processing. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do insist on working on stuff when it is plugged in, only touch it with one hand. Um, because being a guitarist, I have a, an amplifier powered by vacuum tubes and, uh, I had to bias those. And you have to do that with the amp plugged in and on. And so that's one thing you, you make sure that you only, you keep one hand free. So that way you don't ground yourself to anything in the electronics. So that way you don't die. Right. Yes. No death. Definitely no death. And preferably not your guitar hand either. <laughs> I guess you kind of need two hands, but I mean. Preferably. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I, I have just two, like two more. Uh, so you talked about a solder bridge and why, and it's bad. 
why is it bad? So a solder bridge is what I, I, did, I said that and I really didn't describe what that is. A solder bridge is basically when the solder is connecting two things that aren't supposed to be connected. Mm -hmm. It definitely so, looked that way when we were I'm sorry. It looked that way when we were watching it. Like that was clear. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So so what happens is like those traces are connecting all of the pads that need to be connected uh, when to, to make the circuit work properly. Uh, there, are, you know, people are going in and designing the circuits or designing where the, where the components are placed and then how each of the connections, the leads are connected to the other leads using the pads and the traces. So if you bridge two uh, pads or leads that are close to each other, you're gonna connect things that don't necessarily need to be connected and it can cause a problem sometimes with like a chip that has like, you know, a bunch of like eight or 16 pins in it. Some of those pins are actually supposed to be connected. And so a bridge isn't always going to ruin your circuit, but it's more often than not, it will cause a problem. And you could potentially be taking like the power supply from the chip and putting it into the signal, which could overload the chip and blow it. So you can actually even cause like major damage to your components by having a solder bridge. But in general, that's why I, I kind of showed off the continuity meter with the multimeter, where if you touch the two, if, if you cause a continuity, uh, it beeps. You can use the continuity setting on a multimeter to check for solder, br solder bridges and see if you have two things that are connected that aren't supposed to be. In case you can't see it visually. Yeah, or well, what happens is, it's just, you're like, is this a bridge or not? I can't really tell. It's kind of a slot. You do like a sloppy job and you're like, oh, yeah. this looks like a bridge, but I can't tell if it's a bridge or not. So let me try it. it you know, that that's when the continuity uh, gotcha. comes, like setting comes in. Gotcha. Um, and then my, uh, my last card of the, the thing that you, the bear is Vero bar board that you said. Yeah, Vero board. Yeah. -E um, how do you, so that's a great thing to practice, you know, soldering. Uh, how do you, as a total beginner, beginner, like how do you know whether obviously like that diagram that you gave of like this is how it should look, you know, your joint, right? Like, yeah. But like, how do you know if you're doing it right or wrong? If it, you know, like, I don't know, like, because me looking, I always like to test things. Yeah. I, I, I like uh, a not. Yeah, I'm not into the like subjective. Uh, Right, right. So, so the, again, the continuity setting on a multimeter is really helpful for this. So what you can do is like you can, um, because like, so with the Vera board, you got those long strips. Um, the, uh, let me see, one second, let me see if I can find something that might help illuminate have my, my box of projects up. Okay, so this is, you got barrel board and this is called a breadboard. And this is, so with the barrel board, um, let me see if I have a barrel board pump that I have in here. Uh, seem to have lost that part. But so with the barrel board, you remember that there was kinds of strips of copper. And then this is sort of similar where um, each of these lines that you're seeing that are kind of the, whole, the vertical lines are connected. So if you put something in one of these holes here, then every all the holes above it and below it are connected and this kind of cuts a connection here. So these are these like six are connected and these six are connected. Yeah. So what you do is you can build a circuit on this. You don't have to solder anything and there's a bunch of connections that are already made for you. So you can just kind of map it out how you want it to be and then test the circuit and say, all right, this is if you're building something from scratch. You say, okay, that worked. Now I'm going to move it onto a prototyping board. And so you can, you know, have a PCB printed there's companies that you just give them a, a schematic and they make a PCB for you. But if you want to be doing stuff on, you can do stuff with the Vero board, which is sort of, it sort of mimics the same kind of usage of this is that you have a bunch of pads that are connected. And so all you have to do is, and then people make schematics based off of Vero boards. You can like download basically what is like a Vero board starter. It's just like you buy all the pieces and it tells you where to put them in the Vero board and it kind of, can, and the connections are made for you. So what you can do is you can, solder in your component, then touch one of your connectors to your multimeter to the lead coming off of the component, and then put it, I would say like all the way on the other side of the Vero board copper strip. And then if you get continuity, then you're good. Hmm. Um, so if you had like a cold solder joint, the continuity might be beeping, beep, 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 like not constant, because it's kind of making a connection sometimes, but not other times you want it to be like a nice constant beep. And that's, that's how you know you've got a, a good connection. Okay. Uh, and um, you could also, that would just mean that 
your connection is made. If you want to go in deeper and you have, you say you have a one kilo ohm resistor, you can solder that in and then turn your variable around and on the one lead on the one copper strip that the one lead is connected to touch um, one part of your multimeter, then on the other strip, touch the other and see that you have one kilo ohm across those leads. Now, if you start adding in a bunch of a bunch of resistors, it's going to change because you kind of have to look into the theory of how resistors in parallel and series work. But that basically you can test the resistance or the capacitance of the components that you've put in across the leads uh, or like across like the variable strip. So the variable board is, is really good because it's big, there's a lot of space and you can do testing easy. Mm -hmm. And then when, when you're working in a PCB, you do the same thing. That's how I test it. I like, you know, making mistakes on a PCB that I've ordered, I get in there and just check the continuity. You can see where the trace goes and you can say, okay, these are actually supposed to be connected. So let me make sure they are. Mm -hmm. Awesome, cool. Well, that's all my questions. And we're at 446. So uh, I just want to say again, thank you so much to both of you. This is amazing work. A lot of time and effort you guys have put into this and um, just like really appreciate you and your knowledge and your knowledge sharing with us. And um, yeah, let's talk more about all these things in the future. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.